Several years ago, I was uh, teaching a Bible study group that was wrestling with the topic of good and evil. To engage in that study, we were looking at some less than encouraging scriptures, such as Romans 3 and Job 1, where it's a real effort to find the positive. At the time, I remember feeling uncomfortable with the negativity that many of the scriptures we were reading portrayed. It took me a bit to realize why I was struggling with the study. It's because Episcopal priests are trained in seminary to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, my preaching professor told us to write a sermon and then look at it carefully. If we couldn't find the good news, she said rather forcefully, that we were to rip up the sermon and start over again. And I saw her do exactly that to one of my classmates who failed to find the good news in a sermon. Which leads me to today's gospel from Luke. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, how I wish it were kindled. And a bit later, do you think that I come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Ouch. And from there, he goes on to talk to the crowds, calling them hypocrites. His words are harsh and uncompromising and are in opposition to the image of Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Where is the good news in his challenge? Where's the good news in this passage, which contains some of Jesus' harshest words as he warns the coming of the new world will bring division and conflict? Particularly on my last Sunday with you, I would have preferred a gentler gospel. <laughs> Perhaps Jesus is a good shepherd, but one takes what one gets with the lectionary. I wanted you to know that I have enjoyed the seven weeks I've been with you. They seem to have flown by. A big thank you for all your help and your hospitality. I appreciate it more than I can say. But back to the scripture. As I read and prayed over the gospel text, I found myself focusing on the Lord's first statement. I came to bring fire to the earth. Fire fascinates humans. We can stare into the flames for hours. Fire can also frighten us, for fire creates and destroys. For example, the news lately has been full of the forest fires that plague the western United States about this time every year. Looking closely at the process by which fire creates and destroys, we can see that the primary action of fire is one of transformation. Fire changes matter into energy and energy into matter. Fire is an agent of change. Fire can transform flour and water and salt into bread. The meal of the Eucharist nurtures, nurtures us along the pathways of grace. Fire can transform dead wood into heat and light. It can purify dead forests, transforming disease and death into new vital gardens. For example, the California redwood, which is one of the largest trees on earth, can only germinate new trees after a forest fire. Thinking about fire as a transformation agent caused me to think about where that might be illustrated in the scriptures. One Old Testament story that came to mind was concerning fire was Elijah and his contest with the prophets of Baal. Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal and challenges them to have their God set a great pile of wood on fire. After trying the entire morning, the prophets of Baal don't even produce a spark. So after thoroughly soaking the wood with water, Elijah calls upon God to incinerate the pile. Not only does God light the wood on fire, but he also incinerates the prophets of Baal, who were standing near him. Unless you were a prophet of Baal, the story indicates the good news of holy <laughs> personal lives, personal spiritual lives, where might we experience transformative holy fire? Where do we need to get out of our rut of peace at any cost in order to grow in our faith? Master Eichert says in the 13th century, the soul must long for God in order to be set aflame by God's love. But if the soul cannot yet feel this longing, then it must long for the longing. Once we've found that divine fire within us, we live in a world where the light of God shines through, not just through stained glass windows, 
but through everything, if we only have eyes to see. The, true flame, the truth flames out from an unexpected experience or a familiar sight glimpsed differently on a day like any other day, and that is indeed good news. The same idea about transformative holy fire can also describe times in our lives when we experience change and move into transition. Often, those times of transition leave us feeling breathless, unsure, sad, longing for a return to things the way they were. But transformative holy fire is also an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to burn away what is holding us back and reach for new levels where the Holy Spirit beckons us on. Consider this story by Dan and Perry entitled The Parable of the Trapeze. Sometimes I feel that my life is a series of trapeze swings. I'm either hanging onto a trapeze bar swinging along, or for a few moments of my life, I'm hurtling across space in between the trapeze bars. Most of the time, I spend my life hanging on for dear life to my trapeze bar at the moment. It carries me along at a certain steady rate of swing, and I have a feeling that I'm in control of my life. I know most of the right questions, and even some of the answers. But every once in a while, as I'm merrily, or not so merrily, swinging along, I look ahead of me into the distance, and what do I see? I see another trapeze bar swinging towards me. It's empty, and I know in that place in me that knows that this new trapeze bar has my name on it. It's my next step, my growth, my aliveness coming to get me. In my heart of hearts, I know that for me to grow, I must release my grip on this present well-known bar and move to a new one. Each time it happens to me, I hope, no, I pray, that I won't have to let go of the old bar completely before I grab the new one. But in my knowing place, I know that I must totally release my grasp on the old bar, and for some moment in time, I must hurl across space before I can grab onto the new bar. Each time I'm filled with terror, it doesn't matter that in all my previous hurdles across the void of the unknowing, I've always made it. I'm uh, each time afraid that I will miss, that I will be crushed on the unseen rocks in the bottomless chasm between bars. I do it anyway. Perhaps this is the essence of what the mystics call the faith experience. No guarantees, no debt, no insurance policy, but you do it anyway because somehow to keep hanging on to that old bar is no longer on the list of alternatives. So for an eternity that can last a microsecond or a thousand lifetimes, I soar across that dark void of the past is gone and the future is not here yet. It's called transition. I've come to believe that transition is the only place that real change occurs. I mean, real change, not just that pseudo change that only lasts until the next time my old buttons get pushed. I notice that in our culture, this transition zone is looked upon as a no thing or a no place between places. Sure, the old trapeze bar was real, and the new one coming towards me, I hope that's real too. But the void in between? Is that just a confusing, disorienting nowhere that must be gotten through as fast and as unconsciously as possible? No, what a wasted opportunity that would be. I have a sneaking suspicion that the transition zone is the only real thing, and the bars are illusions we dream up to avoid the void where the real change, the real growth, occurs for us. Whether or not my hunch is true, it remains that the transition zones in our life are incredibly rich places. They should be honored, even savored, Yet with all the pain and fear and feelings of being out of control that can, but not necessarily, accompany transitions, they are still the most alive, most growth-filled, passionate, expansive moments of our life. Perhaps that is why Jesus is talking about transforming fire in today's gospel. But what transforming fire did Jesus wish were already kindled? Was he talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit that ignited and transformed the disciples on the day of Pentecost? Was he talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit who 
who has continued throughout the ages to transform lives of believers. Was he talking about the Holy Spirit who gives spiritual gifts and at baptism seals each of the newly baptized and marks them as Christ's own forever? Or was Jesus talking about the baptism of fire that was his crucifixion and death? That baptism of fire allowed God's love to spread like a wildfire from human heart to human heart. Good Friday was a fire of new creation, issuing forth from the furnace of God's mercy and allowing us once again for all time to be forgiven and to be in close relationship with God. Jesus came to bring transforming, purifying fire to the earth. Jesus came to bring new creation. That new creation is not peaceful. It can divide family members from family members through the chasm of belief or unbelief. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Jesus came to bring forth a new creation, kindled by the greatest power in the universe, love, so abundant and pure that our lives are transformed by his baptism of fire on the cross. Transformative fire is what we ourselves can become when we embody, to whatever degree we are able, Jesus' light. Transformative, holy fire, experienced by Moses and Elijah and a host of other biblical characters. Transformative, holy fire that takes our humdrum lives and allows God's love to shine through for others. Transformative, holy fire that allows us to let go of one trapeze bar before we securely have another in hand. Transformative, holy fire that gives us new eyes to see God in all creation. Transformative, holy fire that's the gift of the Holy Spirit and allows us to embody Jesus' life. And that is indeed good news. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.